Marcos was lucky to be born into an extremely affluent family that possessed a food manufacturing enterprise. As he matured, he was given control of the family enterprise, managing to multiply its revenue significantly. Nonetheless, he never had the opportunity to relish the wealth. This narrative unfolded in 2013 in Brazil, the largest and among the most densely populated nations in Latin America. Hosting over 200 million inhabitants, it still harbors wild tribes along the Amazon River's banks that have yet to encounter modern civilization. The iconic Christ, the Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro, stands not just as a beacon of Brazil, but as a symbol for the whole continent. This imposing structure, rising 125 feet, has been acknowledged as one of the new wonders of the world. Renowned for its passion for football and popular telenovelas, Brazil is also celebrated for its vibrant carnival and as the leading coffee producer for more than a century. It was here that 48-year-old Marcos Matsunaga resided with his wife Elise, who was 38 at that time. Despite the decade gap in their ages, they appeared to be blissfully content and were exceedingly affluent. Marcos, a multimillionaire CEO with ambitions of reaching billionaire status, was at the helm of Yoki, a food corporation specializing in snacks such as popcorn and chips. This enterprise, a legacy passed down through his lineage, was established by his grandfather, Yoshizo Kitano, whose name inspired the company's moniker, Yoki. Matsunaga harbored plans to divest the company for a billion dollars, yet he never attained the billionaire milestone. Prior to his relationship with Elise, Marcos had been married and chose to end that union for his newfound love, diving into a maelstrom of desire and imprudence. Whether Elise had any involvement in this decision remains uncertain. Matsunaga had long been disloyal to his spouse with numerous women, with Elise initially being one among many, until he recognized that he had truly fallen. Marcos encountered his future partner on a companion service website. In person, he seldom drew attention from the opposite sex. His physique was larger, with nondescript features and a challenging disposition. Nonetheless, he was in constant search of validation, thus he covertly engaged companions to fulfill his desires. It was through this avenue that he crossed paths with Elise, who would eventually become his subsequent spouse. Elise Matsunaga originated from a highly dysfunctional household, enduring severe poverty. Throughout her youth, she suffered recurring abuse at the hands of her stepfather. As a result, she experienced a tumultuous upbringing, frequently finding herself in difficult situations, exacerbated by the perilous neighborhood her family inhabited. As Elise matured, she broke free from this hazardous milieu and pursued a career in nursing, her inherent compassion, kindness, and generosity made her naturally inclined towards a profession in caring for the ill. Yet, the compassion deeply ingrained in her from a young age paradoxically became her Achilles' heel, rendering her incapable of maintaining professional detachment. Elise found herself overly emotionally invested in her patient's well-being, to the point where their deterioration or demise felt like losing someone intimately precious plunging her into profound grief. The profession increasingly became a source of distress for Elise, who found the emotional demands unbearable, especially after the death of a patient profoundly altered her perspective. Confronted with the unsustainable emotional toll, she decided against continuing her nursing career. In search of a different path, she opted for law. However, to support herself and finance her education, she began offering escort services. Initially, Elise found pleasure in her escort role, engaging in social interactions with men. While the physical aspect associated with her job caused her anxiety, it was through this channel she encountered the affluent Marcos Matsunaga. At that juncture, the Matsunaga lineage stood among the elite in Brazil, their enterprise, Yoki, being a front-runner in the industry, much of its expansion credited to Marcos's stewardship. He surpassed the achievements of his predecessors, propelling the company onto the international stage. Marcos had been indulged with the finest from a young age, enjoyed widespread travel, indulged in lavish pursuits, and savored the essence of life. 
The soul void was a genuine connection with women. Despite his wealth and accomplishments, women showed minimal interest in him. Some perceived him as lacking conventional attractiveness, with his personality possibly contributing to this perception. Regardless, his fortune failed to secure lasting relationships with the attractive women he pursued, who invariably exited his life swiftly. However, before assuming control of the company, while his father remained at the helm, a young woman emerged, demonstrating sincere interest in him. This burgeoning millionaire wed her, driven not by profound affection but by a sense of urgency. Entering into this union, Marco swiftly recognized his discontent. He had acted hastily, choosing poorly, yet rather than pursuing divorce to find a compatible partner, he resorted to infidelity, engaging with women from escort services. Elise notably captivated him to the extent that he expedited his divorce and promptly remarried. Naturally, he had no intention of disclosing to his kin and acquaintances that their meeting was through an escort service, having compensated her for her companionship on multiple occasions. Marcos intended to frame their acquaintance as coincidental, perhaps during a casual café encounter, with the hope that the actual circumstances of their meeting would remain undisclosed. The family refrained from probing, they surmised the truth independently. Elise was notably attractive and, crucially, a decade Marcos's junior. She seemingly leveraged her allure to wed the affluent yet physically unremarkable millionaire eyeing his wealth. Marcos's circle endeavored to unveil Elise's genuine motives, yet he dismissed the notion that she was solely after his fortune, hastily committing to marriage as though fearing her departure. Marco swiftly integrated her into his opulent mansion, adorned with an array of luxury goods. Beyond Elise, his greatest passion was wine. He even established extensive cellars beneath his residence to house his $2 million wine collection. Additionally, a concealed room within the mansion, laden with firearms and ammunition valued at half a million dollars, highlighted the eccentricities amidst his lavish lifestyle, which also featured prized art pieces. Marcos's spending habits on certain luxuries were notably lavish. The matrimony commenced auspiciously. The couple indulged in global travel, immersing themselves in diverse cultures while savoring exceptional wines and cuisine. Shortly post-nuptials, they aspired for a child, leading Elise to discontinue birth control in anticipation of pregnancy. Yet, conception proved challenging. Elise belonged to the group of women facing difficulties conceiving through conventional means. Despite their efforts, success eluded them until they resorted to multiple IVF attempts, ultimately resulting in Elise's pregnancy. Nine months thereafter, they were blessed with a daughter, bringing immense joy to the new parents. Their expansive home now brimmed with baby essentials, nourishment, and playthings. As time passed, Marcos's friends acknowledged their misjudgment about Elise. Their adventures in the forest hunting wild boars and the presence of a snake at home highlighted their uncommon hobbies. Marcos was particularly moved by having someone who appreciated him beyond his wealth for his unique traits. The Matsunaga family lived contentedly. In late May 2012, Marcos Matsunaga, a prominent CEO and food industry giant, went missing amid finalizing a sale of the family business, Yoki, in a deal worth billions. When his wife, Elise, reported his disappearance, the immediate suspicion by police centered on a potential kidnapping. The widespread knowledge of the Matsunaga family's affluence and Marcos's key role in a major deal led to speculation that various individuals might have motives to harm him or disrupt the deal. The investigation into Marcos Matsunaga's disappearance intensified as police interrogated his colleagues, friends, and acquaintances to uncover potential adversaries or individuals who might benefit from his sudden absence. Despite these efforts, no evidence of business conflicts or personal enmities emerged. Marcos appeared not to have had overt rivals wishing for the deal's collapse. Everything seemed to be proceeding smoothly. In their discussions with Elise Matsunaga, detectives aimed to piece together Marcos's routines and his agenda on the day he vanished. Elise recounted that on the evening of his disappearance, Marcos had informed her of a meeting with a prospective buyer willing to purchase Yoki for a billion dollars. He anticipated the negotiations would extend late into the night and advised her not to wait up. 
Additionally, Marcos had an early meeting planned for the following day and mentioned the possibility of spending the night at the office. The next morning, with Marcos still absent and no word from him, Elisa's concern grew. Convinced the situation was a kidnapping for ransom, the police expected the abductors to soon make contact with demands. However, as time elapsed without any ransom requests or threats regarding Marcos's well-being, the case grew colder. Despite exhaustive efforts by detectives to locate Marcos or glean any leads on his whereabouts, the investigation stalled with no tangible evidence or clues to guide them. Shortly after the police launched their investigation, Elisa Matsunaga brought new details to Marcos's parents that she had not disclosed to law enforcement. She informed them Marcos had left of his own accord, taking his belongings with him. According to Elise, Marcos had been unfaithful, engaging with other women, mirroring his behavior from his first marriage. This wasn't his first indiscretion. When confronted with his infidelity, Marcos would plead for forgiveness. At one such juncture, Elise was pregnant with their daughter and chose to stay, prioritizing the future of their unborn child, despite the deep hurt and betrayal she felt. Discovering her pregnancy amidst the turmoil significantly influenced her response to Marcos's cheating, altering her initial impulse to leave. Despite a period of good behavior during the first two years after their daughter's birth, Marcos resumed his unfaithful activities a few months prior to vanishing. In May, Elise had to leave for a week to care for her gravely ill grandmother. Anticipating her husband might exploit her absence, she employed a private investigator to surveil Marcos documenting his actions and gathering video evidence. Her suspicions proved accurate. Marcos was unfaithful every night during her absence, engaging with a woman named Natalia, encountered through the same website as Elise. He invited Natalia to their home and dined with her at restaurants they usually visited together, actions observed by familiar staff who recognized the Matsunaga family. Marcos's behavior seemed a blatant disregard for his marriage to Elise. The private investigator compiled conclusive proof of Marcos's betrayal, presenting Elise with detailed reports of their locations and activities, along with video evidence. Elise shared a video with her parents, capturing Marcos with another woman before his disappearance. When she confronted Marcos with these findings, unlike his previous reactions of excuses or pleas for forgiveness, he offered no justification. Instead, he packed his belongings and departed. It was revealed that Marcos had not been abducted. He had chosen to leave voluntarily. Despite the devastation caused by their son's betrayal, his parents expressed their support for Elise out of compassion for her and their granddaughter. The Matsunaga family assured that the mother and child would be well provided for. The authorities were informed that abduction was not a factor, thus negating the anticipation of ransom demands. Shortly after detectives dismissed the abduction angle, Marcos's brother received an email reassuring that Marcos was fine and there was no cause for alarm. In the message, he expressed remorse for his behavior to Elise, yet he left out details regarding his whereabouts or what he was up to, merely stating he was unharmed and deeply apologetic. The police concluded there was no actual criminal act. Marcos had merely fled after being unfaithful to his spouse, prompting the cessation of their investigation. Nonetheless, in less than a week, a shocking find was made 20 miles from Marcos's residence, the dismembered corpse of a man. It was the remains of Marcos Matsunaga, his body severed into pieces and dispersed throughout fields and woodlands. Some body parts were contained in standard blue garbage bags, with others found amidst the grass, alongside a blue bag holding his clothing, including jeans and a shirt. Given the high-end nature and significant cost of these garments, Surpassing the monthly income of many locals, they were instrumental in identifying Marcos Matsunaga. The discovery of the man's head was the final piece. Dental comparisons confirmed it was indeed the missing magnate. The cause of death was determined to be a solitary bullet wound to the head, resulting in Marcos's demise. Upon receipt of all body segments at the mortuary for analysis, the coroner observed that the incisions were executed with precision and accuracy. This suggested that the individual responsible had a substantial grasp of human anatomy and possibly some medical background. Initially devoid of leads or suspects, 
the investigative team was uncertain about where to commence their probe. Their initial step involved visiting the apartment complex where Marcos resided with his spouse and offspring, aiming to gather all available surveillance footage. Given that Elise was the final individual to have seen him prior to his vanishing, the police sought to trace his last known movements, observe his attire, demeanor on that day, and any peculiar behavior. Upon securing the footage, they commenced its examination, specifically highlighting instances where Matsunaga was visible. He was attired identically to the apparel discovered near his remains, a shirt and designer denim. The earliest footage dated back to May 19, 2012, coinciding with the day Elise concluded her journey prior to her engagement with a private investigator or viewing the incriminating evidence against her spouse. Marcos fetched her from the airport, escorting her and their child back home. Elise did not immediately confront the issue of his infidelity, either during their ride home or within the elevator. The footage depicted them as a seemingly ordinary, affectionate family unit. Subsequently, the cameras captured Marcos later that evening, exiting to retrieve a delivered pizza. He seemed anxious and weary. After obtaining the pizza from the delivery person, he re-entered the complex yet never exited the apartment thereafter. The following morning, Elise Matsunaga was recorded exiting her residence with three notably heavy suitcases, struggling to maneuver them to the elevator. She then departed the complex, managing to load the luggage into a vehicle. Hours later, she returned, absent the cumbersome baggage. The contents of those suitcases and their destination remained a mystery. What transpired within that apartment remains speculative, yet the authorities were persuaded of Elise Matsunaga's involvement in her husband's demise. She was the sole adult present in the apartment with him before his disappearance, raising the question, could she have been responsible for his murder, subsequent dismemberment, and removal of his body using the suitcases? With a plethora of unanswered questions, the law enforcement officials promptly detained Elise, despite her initial denials. The irrefutable evidence from the surveillance videos led to her being formally accused of the offense. Under rigorous interrogation by the investigators, she eventually admitted to the homicide of her spouse, elaborating on the events that culminated in this heinous act. Elise described a prolonged argument that spanned several hours into the night. Amidst the dispute, they decided to order pizza for dinner, as neither had the inclination to cook. Before the pizza's arrival, Marcos exhibited strange behavior, answering a call and retreating to another room for the conversation. Upon his return, he told Elise that it was his father on the line, needing assistance that evening. After they had their meal, Marcos got ready to visit his parents' home. Elise immediately sensed deceit. She was informed by the private investigator's findings that Marcos had been rendezvousing with Natalia every evening for the last week, and despite a brief hiatus, he intended to abandon her for another date. Elise's anger was palpable. She initially aimed to handle the situation with a level head, aspiring to address and resolve the conflict thoughtfully. However, Marcos's pretense of visiting his father triggered Elise's outrage. She could no longer restrain her anger, confronting him with accusations of dishonesty. Marcos, rather than apologizing or attempting reconciliation, reacted with intense anger, labeling her delusional and dismissing her claims as fabrications. He further insulted her, branding Elise as paranoid, insecure, and unstable. The allegation that struck her the hardest was his claim of her being an inadequate mother to their child, a narrative Marcos had subtly suggested during their relationship. Yet enduring such derogatory remarks, especially upon discovering his infidelity, was overwhelming for her. Externally, the Matsunaga family portrayed an image of happiness, yet beneath the surface, they were deeply troubled. Marcos was an exceedingly possessive and domineering spouse who restricted Elise from maintaining male friendships. He frequently called her, around every 30 minutes, to monitor her location and ascertain if men were present during her law studies. Elise was even compelled to request her male peers to remain silent in the background while she conversed with Marcos over the phone. Throughout their union, Marcos belittled Elise, instilling feelings of worthlessness and inadequacy within her. He continually referenced her previous occupation in escort services, 
belittling her by saying he had rescued her from degradation and mockingly doubting her ability to find someone else who would value her past, effectively reducing her to merely an object for sexual exploits. Elise had envisioned a transformed life through her marriage to Marcos, yet he failed to recognize her worth. On the fateful night, Marcos reiterated those demeaning remarks, and during their altercation, he struck her face. This physical assault marked the first instance of such aggression in their relationship, which had previously been limited to verbal abuse. For Elise, this act was a breaking point. She could no longer endure his maltreatment and immediately resolved to seek a divorce, which she declared to Marcos. He responded with calmness, stating she could leave but would not be allowed to take their daughter with her. He threatened to use his financial influence to challenge her custody claims, asserting she was unfit for motherhood and hinting at institutionalization for mental illness if she attempted to take their child. Marcos's threats and manipulation were constant throughout their marriage. The night's events were a haze for Elise, dominated by tumultuous emotions. At one juncture, she found herself with a gun in hand, while Marcos tauntingly dared her to fire. Acting without full awareness, she aimed and discharged the firearm at Marcos, fatally wounding him. Realizing the gravity of her actions, panic ensued. Aware of the imminent life imprisonment and the impact on her daughter, losing both parents, Elise sought to conceal the crime. With no other method to dispose of the remains, she resolved to dismember the body and relocate it. Utilizing hunting knives, typically employed for disassembling boar carcasses, which Marcos had taught her to use adeptly for skinning and cutting through bone and tissue, she undertook the grim task. Ironically, the pistol, taught to her by Marcos for protection, became the instrument of his demise. In the fortnight after the slaying, Elise Matsunaga masqueraded as a mournful widow, all the while consumed by fear that her deeds would come to light. Her actions of meticulously dismembering her spouse's remains cast a shadow over any semblance of compassion, marking a stark contrast to the heinous act. It is argued by some that Elise concocted stories of mistreatment and verbal abuse, given that Marcos was no longer able to contest these allegations. The team of prosecutors, after examining the evidence, highlighted that the bullet's path suggested Marcos was either seated or reclining, effectively vulnerable at the moment he was shot. This led to the conclusion that Elise had deliberately planned the killing of her affluent husband. Compounding the grim scenario, their child was in an adjacent room when the murder occurred. Further, an autopsy uncovered that Marcos had blood in his lungs, a sign he was still alive when Elise started to behead him. Elise denied any knowledge of how Marcos could remain alive after a gunshot wound to the head. Eventually, Elise Matsunaga was convicted for the murder and the subsequent dismemberment of her husband's corpse. She received a sentence of 19 years and 11 months behind bars, with her anticipated release set for 2035. The care of their young daughter has been taken up by Marcos's parents, who report that she is faring well. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon.